Thank you all so much for coming. Welcome to season three, lecture three of our public lecture series called Forward Question Mark, The Wisconsin Idea, Past and Present. So I'm really happy to present um, our lecturer, uh, Alfonso Morales is a professor of planning and landscape architecture at UW-Madison. His affiliations include the School of Medicine and Public Health, the Institute for, of Research on Poverty, uh, Chicano and Latin Studies. He is a Vilas awardee of the UW, uh, a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellow and a dissertation fellow of the American Bar Association. He is originally from New Mexico with roots and family farming there and in West Texas. He is a researcher, advocate, and practitioner consultant on food systems and public markets, as well as the organization and regula regulation of these activities. Um, I met Alfonso. He was, um, he was uh, a visiting faculty member in sociology. Um, and was ultimately uh, made full professor in landscape and urban planning. And um, I heard him give a spectacular lecture on the radio, University of the Air, with Emily Auerbach, which screamed Wisconsin idea. So I'm super, super thrilled to present to you Professor Alfonso Morales. screen the Wisconsin idea into a live mic. Back in the day, right? Tom can probably remember it. Chad can probably remember whenever you would lecture to two or three hundred and you didn't have a mic, right? The, the technology was very different at the time. So, well, I appreciate the invitation. I have enjoyed a wonderful relationship for many years with Chad, uh, in, per in particular through his scholarship and work not just in faculty governance, but in, in, a, in, in a scholarship on a historical understanding of state and relationship to society. So it makes perfect sense that, that uh, he would be part of this. And I look forward to learning more about Tom. But of course, you know, and, and Gwen, I appreciate her, the opportunities I've had to visit with her about in her role as the speaker's group. But of course, Pat was just such a, Patrick was such a, uh, a friend of mine whenever we first came to campus 15 years ago and talking about supportive, there he was. Okay, so we'll, we'll see. I see that this audience is maybe not what I kind of thought of this as was going to be mostly undergraduates and so I thought to myself I was going to organize it for that, for that classroom so I was a bit remiss you might say but uh, let's play along. Let me tell you a little bit about my work over the years with communities of different sorts. Um, this is, this is a, a small fraction, but it represents different parts of my life. I've been a professor for 24 years now, and so 24 years ago, when I was a fellow at the American Bar Foundation, I uh, worked on the regulation of street vending in Chicago, and I sought to understand how it was a large public market in Chicago, Maxwell Street Market, with a thousand vendors, organized itself week after week after week in the absence of the state without any intervention by the state. And how it was this heterogeneous ethno ethnic uh, situation got composed, how in effect they solved the Hobbesian problem of order, right? Thomas Hobbes's problem of order. Uh, and, and I went on from there to, to be supportive over the last 20 odd years of street level commerce. Uh, work that I did in collaboration with the Street Vendor Project in New York City helped change the uh, city ordinances there a few years ago with respect to to street, to street vending. Theorizing and supporting immigrants. So for instance, um, I did work, uh, so the work that I first talked about was at the University of Arizona. The, this work was at the University of Texas at El Paso and at, at UTEP, what I did was work with immigrant community there, migrant workers, and tried to help them um, find resources to achieve a higher quality of life. And the way we did that was not so much by handing them things or, or by plugging them into resources, but uh, I won an award from the Health Resources Services Administration, US uh, NIH agency, 
and to or organize them, to help them organize themselves into a club that would then allocate resources to each other on the basis of time given to one another. So given that everybody's time is valuable, yours is valuable, I hope in an hour you don't feel it's wasted, but given that everybody's time is valuable, the, the notion there was that in working with each other, they should be remunerated, even if they couldn't be paid money. So they paid time into the club and got money out to buy new, uh, new clothes for their kids, uh, pay medical bills, particularly dental bills, pay for gas, for cars, for rides back and forth, fix broken windows in their, in their places, pay utility bills, and a, sort, a variety of things. The key thing here is that they did it themselves. They organized the club themselves. That's the central point, right? They did it themselves. We supported them, but they did it themselves. Um, most recently, I, I organized, I created a thing called uh, Metrics and Indicators for Impact. This is a toolkit that farmers market managers around the country can use to understand the various, to collect data themselves and understand the various impacts that they have in, that their market has in their community. Economic impacts, food security impacts, uh, ecological impacts, for instance, greenhouse gas emissions, right? Miles farm to market, the way that things are traveled, walkability aspects of the market, whatever the metrics are that they value the most. What they deem important in their community is what the, the toolkit is designed to support them in learning about in a scientifically valid and robust way, in a way that then makes them more legitimate to folks that they're working with, makes them more legitimate to partners that they share. So, and you can, so I sent the slides and there's some hot links in the slides that you can click on things, right? You can go to things. So this is myfimarkets.org. It's actually a fee for service of the University of Wisconsin. Okay. So my thesis in thinking about this is that there are really many ways forward. When thinking about the Wisconsin idea that there's a number of different ways to move forward. What is the best way to learn something? Somebody tell me, what's the best way to learn something? Patrick? Learn by doing. Learn by doing. There we go. Anybody else have an idea? What's the best way to learn something? Mentor. Through a mentor? Okay. By listening to your parents who always know everything. <laughs> Indeed. As I surely did. Tom. Teach. Teach. Indeed. So all of these, right? There's no one way forward, right? All of these resonate with all of us. And they resonate because in different parts of our lives, different activities that we have, different uh, purposes that we ha we've had, or different circumstances, right? They've each meant something to us. They've each, we've, we have indeed learned something <laughs> from, from these experiences. So what should we expect of our organizations? Should we expect organizations to deploy one mode of, <laughs> right? No, of course not. However, it's the case, as sociologists among us know all too well, that organizations are designed uh, in order to uh, convey information in particular ways, uh, effectively following the sort of ro uh, rules, routines, and responsibilities associated with the organization. So these things are at odds. These things are at odds with one another. In the course of learning, then, there's the best way to learn something. There's ways that organizations help us learn things. Whose perspective matters most in this? Whose perspective? So let me just go to the thesis, which is simple, that it's the user's perspective that matters the most. And understanding that, process, that, that perspective in its various processes, in the way, in the, the way it's threaded together, and through dialogue, best delivers on the Wisconsin idea. Okay? So let me review some things that you've probably, well, let me start with this. Dialogue. With whom? Processes. What do we mean? What do we mean? Well, by dialogue, when you think about dialogue, you always think about it in, uh, in a particular instance with respect to a shared reference. Right? So if I'm in dialogue with my dad, right? There's a shared reference. He can't be my dad unless I'm his son. That reciprocal interaction 
characterizes shared points of reference, right? Likewise, boss. Likewise, student, right? I can't be somebody's student unless they elect to be my, my, uh, my teacher, right? You are students here, so it's that shared reference point. Now, those examples are, are kind of easy, right? But you get the idea. Likewise, organizations. Organizations are full of people in particular roles and respons with particular roles and responsibilities. Those organizations uh, uh, take their meaning from the shared reference that people have. That shared reference is a starting point for any kind of dialogue. In the absence of that shared reference, there's trouble. So my example to the young people, but the old folks will remember this as well, you know, when you're a young person, right, and you're trying to go out, you're finding somebody to go on a date with, you know, if you come away from some interaction thinking, did they or did they, were they not interested in me? Well, if you're not on the same page, you're going to be embarrassed, right? You're going to be in trouble. You're going to be embarrassed. So it's, it's a shared reference point that, that uh, promotes dialogue between people. Now, of course, this dialogue is not in just instances of time. This dialogue emerges and evolves over long processes, right? As long as uh, uh, my parents were willing to pay my bills, no. As long as I was willing to do the farm work, milk the cow every other day, they were happy to have me around. As soon as I understood that college was around the corner, I was out of there, right? And they were probably pretty happy about that as well. So anyways, when we think about these processes, we actually have to stop and think about how processes unfold over time and what kinds of processes there are. <coughs> One thing to remember is that there are intrapersonal processes. We think, we, sometimes we even stop and think and, and conceive of a new path, right? And when we do that, we're in dialogue with ourselves. And this is important. This is uh, an old insight from philosophy and so sociology that uh, we could talk for classes and classes about. But the point is very simple. How and what you become is a result in part of this inner dialogue that you have with yourself with respect to your experiences, with respect to your interactions with others. Then, of course, there's interpersonal dialogue. Right? And that interpersonal dialogue can be characterized in many, many ways. Broadly speaking, let's characterize it as social, religious, political, and economic. The big kind of institutions, you might say, that organize society. And here by institutions, I mean the system of ideas and behaviors that characterize these. I don't mean institution in the sense of a prison or, uh, or, or a school or something like that. Now, those interpersonal processes are always located in shared roles and responsibilities, a shared reference point about the roles in, that are being played. So auditing. So I haven't seen Frank in I don't know how many years. I see him. And he tells me he's auditing this class. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I came in here thinking I was just going to talk to undergraduates. Well, you know, here we go. So uh, that interaction caused me to think not just about somebody I knew, but about the activity I was about to execute. All of a sudden, I went from uh, walking in to do a job to all of a sudden seeing somebody I hadn't seen in a while, and of course being happy to see other people I've known for a long time. And then saying to myself, oops, I, gotta, I, I better get back on the, back in the saddle and think about the job I'm about to do. In any case, so that's simply to say that oftentimes the ways, the, the language that we use in these different institutions gets jumbled up or gets very close together, gets mixed together and, and can confuse us, but it's okay. And then of course there's organizational processes that happen over long periods of time. And by organizational process I mean things like how this building was massed and in this particular site. How it's located with respect to everything else in the city. That sort is the result of organizational processes that are intended to have a long effect, right? And of course there's other organizational processes that are much, much closer to home, like when you get a traffic ticket from a policeman or something like that. But by and large, we might think of these organizational processes in terms of the Wisconsin idea anyways, as economic or as legal and political. Because a lot of what the Wisconsin idea has been about historically as well as contemporary is about e either economic sorts of things or legal political things. I think what I want you to take away from this is not just simply dialogue in these dimensions, but the idea that this dialogue is always going to have 
is always going to have uh, some scale associated with it. It'll have an interpersonal scale or some other sort of scale associated with it. And it's going to have some purpose. Now that purpose may not be immediately visible to someone, but there, there are purposes in, in, in dialogue. Okay, so now let's go back over the Wisconsin idea, things you've heard before, but things you're going to hear again, but I hope you hear them now. I'm going to try and present them with a little different, a little different twist. So obviously, it's born of a historical moment, right? Gwen pointed out, and, and the historians pointed out, that uh, the social gospel was prevailing at the time. I've actually written on this subject myself. And uh, the uh, uh, important strands in, in social scientific thinking came about at this, at this time. Uh, and the impulse was, who can we do the most for by way of the sort of broadest stroke. And that was like legislation. Uh, but think about it. The Wisconsin idea is basically abstract, right? There's nothing concrete in that phrase, right? It doesn't tell anybody what to do, when to do it, how to do it. It's empty of specifics. So oftentimes people talk about the spirit of an idea, or the spirit of the laws, Montesquieu's famous writing on, on uh, that I'm very, very friendly to that. I'm actually teaching next week in research design. But anyways, the, the idea is that its spirit, the spirit of something, is never just in one thing. And, and if something, if something has a spirit, it's got to be public. This is that reciprocal orientation that I was speaking of. Okay. Uh, if something has a spirit, then it's got to be shared. It's got to be part of a common frame of reference. That's why people can talk about epochs, right? They can talk about what characterized a period of time. Even if there was variation in that, what were sort of the, some of the broad characteristics of a particular time, particular place? So one of the ways that, that on that web page, right, that the idea is characterized, is framed, is, is, is its impact, is its economic impact. Okay? That's, its current, that's, that's its current framing on the outward face of the University of Wisconsin uh, webpage. Now, having said that, I want to make a, what I think is an important point, and that is that the spirit of something is, while it lies in a common frame of reference, it is generative. Right? It is generative. And this is Montesquieu's point. Laws and Willard Hurst's point, right? Law should be, uh, should generate activity. Law should release the energy of people. That's what law should do. Law shouldn't be a constraint <coughs> on us, right? It should release the energy that people have. I hate to say it, this is an earlier version of my slides. I make the point more forcefully in another version. But in any case, so when, we, when, when you're asked in the syllabus, I noticed, to think about the spirit of the idea. I want you to think about the spirit of the idea and, what, and, and who all will have your version of that spirit in common with what, what they think. Where will there be congruence? Where will there be agreement in the ways that people think about the idea? Will the way you think about the idea generate more activity? Will it generate responses? Will it actually convey something useful into the community? Okay. So here I think that while we can think about uh, the Wisconsin idea in a number of ways associated with politics and government, economics, education, humanities, and social life, and that each of these inform each other, when they're done in a more inclusive way and in dialogue with other people, and over time, then we have its most robust representation. Now, when we think about the Wisconsin idea, we also need to think about who, so I know these slides are, are because the other set of slides, who is the Wisconsin idea? So often do we, th do we ask ourselves, what is the Wisconsin idea? Instead, we should often be asking ourselves, who is the Wisconsin idea? Was I practicing the Wisconsin idea with migrants on the U.S.-Mexico border in El Paso, Texas 15 years ago? Was I in the spirit of the idea? 
So the question is, is who is the Wisconsin idea? Not simply what is it, right? Because who it is, who it is that's enacting it, who it is that's making it live, therein lies uh, the answer to many questions about what it should be doing. So next point I would, I would make in this regard is that a university, right, is a big crazy thing. It's a universe. As a professor at the university, am I one of the who of the Wisconsin idea, or am I only a professor at the university? So in other words, is there a reciprocal relationship between me and my public person, my public role as a professor? Is there a relationship between me and that role and me as citizen, 530202 Shano Terrace, Madison, Wisconsin, 53705? Reporting for duty to the idea. Right? So, oftentimes when we have thought of the idea, we've thought of it principally in a one directional kind of way. It's to people. When is it with people? When, does it, when is it between people? I got to send the right set of slides because the last. When is it between people, not just with people? When is it between people? When is it something that, that people feel the spirit of? It is said that the idea is the application of intelligence and reason to the conditions of the time. Consider the word application. It has two principal uses. One, in the sense of applying for a job. Rather, relatively speaking, one way sort of approach to thinking about things. Or it has the, the notion of application based on engagement. If you're applying yourself in the course of learning something with other people especially, well, you know, there's, you're, you're applying yourself. If you're applying yourself learning how to weld, well, you have a teacher and you're engaged in a relationship that's critical of your welds and you're looking at them and you're seeing where the bubbles are and you're trying to break them and you're trying to understand what happened there. Well, whatever it is that you're doing, you're working at it uh, in, a, in a spirit of engagement, in a relationship with people. Now, it has been pointed out that there's always been a tension that for many decades there's been a tension between the delivery of service and support of people through delivering them services and engaged serving of people working with people seeing them as partners as it were so one of the things that i'd like to ask though and i'd like to ask all of you when is expert delivery of intelligence and reason appropriate when do we want expert delivery? Do, is there ever a time that we want it? When you have a particular question? When you have a particular question, but a little bit more. A particular question about? A crisis situation. Sure, maybe a crisis situation. So you're not necessarily going to go to your auto mechanic for uh, what to do uh, in a flood or something like that. Not necessarily, right? Something that's meaningful. So, so something very meaningful. So like, when am I going to go to intelligence and reason? Whenever I've got to go uh, get surgery. As much as I value Chad's skill, and as sharp as I can make the scalpel for him, I don't think he's going to operate on me. Right? Right? So there are times that we're going to go for intelligent in, intelligence and reason whenever you might say that problems have both a technical aspect and a limited number of solutions. And indeed, that has given rise to something we call the professions. Right? The professions are often populated by people who have a fairly technical understanding of things. Law, medicine are the best examples, right? Uh, and the solutions to those things are relatively stable, change over time, right? But they're relatively stable. So what happens though, right? Even medicine, even law, right? There's, there's new cases, new precedents, new medical research. And so in effect, they are uh, 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 participants in, consumers of the work of the university, the work of the idea, as it were. Okay, so at this point I was gonna have you all think and pair up and talk about that stuff, but I won't do that. Um, so let's think about this, though. At the idea 
it, it, it came at its historical moment. It's practiced in our historical moment, but it's never, it didn't come by itself, right? It came as part of an ecology of other things that were kind of coming along, all right? Its antecedent was the land grant, which you've heard a little bit about, and which has gone through different iterations, right? The land grant has the 1890 land grants that were associated with historically black colleges and universities. 30 years ago, uh, for Native American groups, there is now a quasi-land grant of Hispanic serving institutions. Other parts of this are the ecology of organizations. I asked you a little while ago to think about purpose and scale. Look at this. This is cooperative extension, right, which you've got a sense of the distinction between cooperative and, and other. All right. That sounds like the Wisconsin idea. Look at the different, think about the different purposes and scales that are in play here. much of this is thinking out loud, how much of this is expert driven, right? How much of it is community driven? Where, where do the two meet? Where, is there, where are their partnerships, right? When are there, right? I don't have a specific answer to this question. It's because I looked at the syllabus for 15 minutes earlier today and I thought, hmm, this would be an interesting thing to remind people about. All the, the, these slides would be interesting things to remind people about. So let's think, whose purpose right, is being served? What scale is in operation? Where do you see in those examples self-governance and economic self-sufficiency being fostered? Even if we haven't dis defined those clearly, where, are those, where do we see those practiced? Uh, how about extension? You can just click on a, click the map, every, every county, right? So again, scale, purpose. Notice how these folks are framing themselves, discussing their, their, their practice. Now let's, let's take a brief digression to consider uh, extension and cooperative extension in light of the reading that I had to read, uh, Brian, Raisin's, uh, Raison's short piece on Ohio State Extension. What was Raison up to? What was the concern that he had? Who, can, who was able to read it and articulate that? What did he say? So in Ohio State Extension, they had the same kind of problem that many extension services have had over the decades, and that's a changing relevance of rural life to American society. When I went to high school, 30 kids in my high school graduating class, you were either in FFA, Future Farmers of America, or in FHA, does anybody know, anybody remember what that stands for? 
Homemakers? Future Homemakers of America, right? That, that organization no longer exists. FFA has changed itself quite a bit and is often found and is growing in urban areas around the country. Um, but the, the, the point is, is that in Ohio, they saw, like as, as we saw here in Wisconsin, although I'm not part of Extension, I don't know this, but I know it secondhand, that there was a, a, a concern with the changing role uh, and relationship of rural life to the university and to the future of the state. And because dairies were getting larger, they were fewer and getting larger and a whole variety of things. And so Raisan sat, thought about this and said, well, what should extension do? Should we be facilitators of things or should we be informers of situations? That was his fundamental tension. And of course, he said, well, we should be both. There should be many forms of uh, the relationship between town and ground, gown, right? The relationship between expert knowledge and communities in action. Whose purpose and what scales did you see in this? I would ask that you let th that question inform your writing for this class. Whose purpose? What scale? Where is there self-governance? What kind? Where is there economic self-sufficiency? What kind? So how about implementing the idea? Have, have you all been shown the Wisconsin Idea Database yet? Do you all know where, where you are? So just for fun, the Wisconsin Idea in Action is a searchable database. Take a look. Let's try it. Somebody give me a topic. Mushrooms. Mushrooms? Yeah. Oops. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I play hangman with my graduate students. I win about 30% of the time, too. So let's see what happens. And they had a chance to read what, but anyway. Urban garden. Okay, urban garden. Let me go with urban garden. Three entries. Purpose, scale. Urban horticulture field day. It happened one day, I guess. We Badger volunteers. Happened for a month. Determination of alternative water sources from Milwaukee County Cooperative Extension Urban Gardens. I actually contributed to that. Somebody asked me about the law of public use of water for agriculture in cities. And I actually wrote them a memo about, about that. Huh. Is my name in there? Let's see. No, but I, yeah, I helped her. <laughs> That's funny. Anyways, so you can, you go around here and, and if you type something crazy like agriculture, you get 24 entries of all kinds of scales and sizes and whatnot. I did not talk about my work with uh, formerly incarcerated people in South Madison, but there it is. Uh, different, all kinds, Midwest Dairy and Beef Husbandry con Conference. What is the spirit of the Wisconsin idea if it isn't manifested at all sorts of scales and to all sorts of purposes? Now, of course, asking ourselves how that should be governed, how those should be sorted, what might be better or worse representations of the idea, that's a different lecture. <laughs> but, I hope you get the idea of what I'm talking about here. Where do you see, as you're looking through these databases, as you see, as you see the hundreds of projects, many that are ongoing still, that the university has with community partners in Madison, in the state, in the country, and around the world, okay? Ask yourself, where is there self-government here going on? Where is there economic self-sufficiency? happening. 
Okay. So one of the things to do is you might ask yourself, well, this is great, but this is like, you know, a bag of Halloween candy. You know, there's a whole bunch of different things in there and I don't know how to make sense of them. You know, this is like a, uh, you know, uh, it's a kind of a complicated thing you've just shown us. Morales, you've just shown us all these different web pages with all these different things going on in them. How am I supposed to make sense of that? Well, obviously, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to make sense of it because there's no one way to make sense of it. But let me give you a couple of tools and let you practice for five minutes with them, okay? You can see variation in scale and kind of engagement. So everybody get out something to write with for two minutes, okay? For, for few minutes with me. If you've got something to write with, or if you've got, with those of you with computers, open up a table and, and choose three by three, okay? So that you can create a two by two table for the, for the contents, okay? And just for fun, on one dimension, put smaller and larger, and on the other dimension, put humanistic and science. So uh, a small humanistic project that involves the Wisconsin idea might be what? I don't know, and I don't expect you to answer that question either. What I'm doing is giving you a way to sort your observations. I'm giving you a way to think about those observations and to sort those observations semi-systematically so that you can represent not just what you see, but represent what you see to somebody else in papers you write or ways you, that you think about this. Okay? Another way to do it might be to say to yourself, self-governance. Right? I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I would betray my esteemed professors if I did not, do, if I did not now do this. You just made this little two-by-two two table, right? Now, and, and you just populated it with larger and smaller in one dimension, humanistic and science on another. But the Wisconsin idea represents lots of different things. Okay? So, choose for yourself different dimensions. Not large or small, well, maybe large and small on one side, but not humanistic and science on another. Put different dimensions by which you might understand or represent or sort out different projects associated with the Wisconsin idea. <coughs> Take a couple minutes and try it, please. Somebody please share with me. Please share with the class. What, what did you do for your two by two? Your, your distinct, the distinct dimensions for understanding the practice of the Wisconsin idea? Yes? I belong to an organization called the Italian Workman's Culture in Medicine. Okay. And we have a sister city called Montana in Italy. Okay. And so this is we're an organization that we're self-governed. We have the president and the vice president, the whole, whole uh, way of looking at things and, and developing things. But we also work with the city of Montaba, with their political, the mayor, the all the political, the all the men, the councilmen, and stuff like that. So we really don't get any assistance with that relationship with the state uh, or with the city. They like to join us when we do things, but looking at then what we do with them, uh, it's very humanistic and science-wise. We do cultural exchanges, social exchanges, um, athletics competitions. They do the soccer teams over here um, and such. Uh, water study. We do a lot. Monta Vista, you know, Monta Italy. It looks physically and geography much like Madison, Wisconsin. It's surrounded by water and, and lakes. We're a natural connection. So they're very interested. So we introduce them to 
University of Wisconsin experts, professors, and students. And then when we go over there, they introduce us and to their folks. So I kind of see that we, even though we're not the university, we pretty much are promoting the Wisconsin idea of what we're doing. It sure seems to me. Now, I don't know if you all heard everything that was just said, but he belongs to the Italian Working Man's Club. They enjoy a, a relationship with a city in Italy. They enjoy a variety of cultural exchanges. They, do, they share expert knowledge between each other. And so in effect, uh, what he did was show how within the science, humanistic, and larger and smaller dimensions, how each of those cells is populated in the course of his particular relationship. And one of the other things that you said is you spoke to the question of geography, right? Mm -hmm. And in, indeed, instead of large or smaller, right, on one side, you can put national or international, right? And so that would then constrain the example to only the international, right? Uh, or mostly to the international dimension as a way of sorting out, as a way of representing the activities of Wisconsin ID. So my, my point here is that there's a variety of ways to see how the idea is practiced. And as you're going through, you might ask yourself, is the idea practiced as a, as a way of educating people? Is it a way of giving people tools or training? Or is it a way of helping people uh, finish tasks or achieve goals that they have? Or is it something else entirely? Does it have to do with how they make a living? Does it have to do uh, with other kind of more specific things having to do with how they act politically in the world? So. When I, as I think about my, my, the work that I did, one of, the, one of the things that I've always tried to do is help people develop their ability to be more fully themselves. Right? And in order to be more fully human in the world, you have to have uh, more opportunities to exercise that, human, that humanity. And so one way forward is to suggest this that the idea's real purpose is to foster the fullest expression of human life in any given activity and to release the energy of society. This is Willard Hearst's book, Law and the Condition of Freedom, 1956, uh, University of Wisconsin law professor. So what does it mean then to foster this full expression of human life in each of these different dimensions? Well, socially, I think that you would see that what I believe is to foster the opportunity for interaction. Not simply to behave in the world, but to act with others, to interact with others in light of mutual goals, mutually advantageous goals, or just for fun. You remember the UW Extension page, it talked about entertainment. How many of you ever thought about the University of Wisconsin Extension as a source of entertainment? How many of you thought about the Wisconsin idea as a source of recreation or recreation? Right? So socially, making the opportunity for interaction. Economically, if you're only living to work, you don't have much opportunity to do anything else. So economically, right, the notion of self-sufficiency embedded in it is the idea of earning to live. That self-sufficiency shouldn't uh, um, be the end of one's participation in the other dimensions of life. It should be a jumping off point that enables a fuller participation in life. So perhaps the Wisconsin's idea, ideas, uh, in, uh, efforts in making, in giving people opportunities to live to their fullest, perhaps it's in terms of of uh, this economic idea of trying to achieve, if not self-sufficiency, reasonable opportunities that launch people into other parts of life. Politically, engaging in governance in its many forms. Governance might be uh, in your religious organization, right? Governance might, might be uh, in your neighborhood block group or something like that. Uh, it might be in, in voting. It might have a variety of things associated with it. But engagement is something that's, without engagement, we, don't, we can't have a Wisconsin idea. Because we can't have partners who would inform us as to what's going on. 
Religiously, we have to remember that people are acting in the name of their values. Even if they're not religious, they have values that they're acting on. And it is interaction across those values that we want to foster. So one of the things that, that again, it's missing from this slide deck. I hope that I can remember what the point was. Um, the video people, hello video people in the future. Look at my slide deck in the 2018 version of Canvas. <laughs> but, but um, and I can't remember what the point is. I'm trying to make it. But who it is we are, right? Who it is that's part of the Wisconsin idea. It is only through relationships with each other that we can discover the full partnership potentials that we have. Now I remember, because I'm looking at Gwen. One of the things I've advocated to campus for many years is that we have something called the reverse Wisconsin idea. That in order to have fulfilled partnerships, what we should be doing is bringing people from around the state to Madison to tell us eggheads what we should be thinking and doing. So it's, it's this, and, and, and indeed, to enjoy the fruits of this world-class campus. Right? They're coming here anyways for state football tournaments or whatever it happens to be. Let's give them the opportunity to, to uh, tell us to, to, to be more full, more complete citizens uh, by engaging with this here on campus. Because it's interaction that we wish to foster. So that's the point that's not in this deck that I'm going to email Kim in a little while. Our encounter with others, our encounter with others, our recognition of common references, that is what is, helps us all become more fully human. And it's at the heart of society, and I believe it's at the heart of the idea that fosters a more healthy society and has for 100 years, and I hope will for all the years ahead. I thank you for your attention. And let's, let's have some Q&A if that's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's talk in the words of earth, wind, and fire. Let's talk. Yes, sir. So, so in the reading, there was a comment on social capital. And you've really embedded the notion of of interactions. I mean, you're bolding it right there right. as being a critical element of the idea. Right. And that fits with some of the history we've heard. How would you extend that notion into the way we exist now? Often interaction, we, we, we hear concerns that interaction is being altered by the, the way we connect and by tweets, which don't have a lot of uh, information involved. So, so what is the status of interaction now, and how do you think it either succeeds or fails at moving us toward the notion of the, the Wisconsin idea? Yeah. And, and then, if it doesn't work, how can you fix it? What, what's your great yeah. idea? So <laughs> right, the, the, the key here is shared reference. So what we, what we see a lot of folks uh, commenting on, which folks have predicted for 30 years. Okay? This has been predicted by some social scientists for a long time. This fragmentation of society. Okay? And I'm not talking about the diminishment of social capital as much as I'm talking about uh, the relative erosion of shared frames of reference. Okay? Because in the absence of a shared frame of reference, right, it's very hard to convey meaning across different groups. And, and so, so there is, so it is, so I think that this is a tough situation. We're in a tough situation. When we moved here, there were two daily newspapers. And my dad said, wow, that boy delivers the paper? Yes, sir. Yeah, he comes by every day and delivers the paper in the afternoon. You know, there were, there were, you know, I mean, now, to look back, though, and to say, to pine for some <laughs> supposedly better past, right, that's kind of a non-starter. As far as I can tell, in this universe, time is only going one way, right? It may be different some other universe, right? But this is the one we've got, right? So how is it, then, that we seek opportunities for dialogue that foster those shared references? 
You know, one of the things that one of the things that we're all I I don't know. Okay, I honestly don't know. One of the things that I do know about what I the efforts that I make is whenever I'm with somebody, I really try and be really present to them. You know, even if I'm at a conference. And anybody in here who's been to conferences knows how that goes, right? Conferences are their own kind of special animal, right? But even at conferences, I try and, you know, be, as, be present to people. In classrooms, I try and be super present to people. I've, I've never, I didn't, I'm old enough that I didn't really use a lot of social media and, and I use it to, to foster my metrics and indicators work and I use it for other purposes. But as a person, I don't use it. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to say. One of the things that we know at a court as, as is written in different places, Rayson wrote it as well, change is not an option, right? Change is going to happen. And indeed, you look at different sort of data points, and people are um, avoiding some social media more than they used to. They're thinking twice about uh, their engagement. They're doing it in uh, legal terms with respect to privacy concerns and considerations, but also social concerns with respect to how it is humans are able to communicate with each other and interact with each other. And so you see a lot of talk about, you know, uh, getting out in the woods, right? And books saying, you know, get your kids out, you know, out in the, you know, and other sorts of things, right? So I, I don't have a, a particular, but does somebody else want to comment on that? Because I don't have. You have an opinion about online learning versus face-to-face, -face, your classroom style, one-on-one? -on -one. So I, I grew up with the face-to-face -face and uh, the online, obviously, later in my life. And uh, I don't do well uh, with the online, just the focus. And it's just a screen, and I can turn it off, I can walk away. Versus if I have you in front of me or another teacher or somebody that I'm working with, it's very hard for me not to be focused and to walk away. So, so, I guess so I'm on the old school side of you bet. I think that the quick response to this is that there are tools, right? When, when what is, needs to be learned is technical, right? And has relatively limited uh, ways of present, uh, being presented, sometimes online works really well. An example that I point to is something called the Khan Academy, which teaches a host of things. But what I understand, math, right? Does, it, there's certain things that Khan does super well with people. Um, so, so uh, there are many, many ways forward, I think, there. Were you going to say something, Chad? Well, I did have a question. It's on a slightly different aspect of your talk. Um, so, uh, in your talk, you, uh, you know, as far as I understood it, you were advocating a, kind of a, a pluralistic approach or right. understanding of the Wisconsin idea, trying to get us to see that it has uh, different dimensions. Um, that it involves multiple purposes, multiple scales, and so on. And I, I like that. I, I, you know, I like uh, pluralistic approaches in general. But I do wonder, um, you know, if we, if we take that kind of pluralistic approach, um, how do we distinguish between, to put it bluntly, how do we distinguish between something that is a genuine expression of the spirit of the Wisconsin idea and versus uh, somebody who's co-opting the term co-opting the language, using it as a slogan for something that's not really in the spirit of the Wisconsin idea. And mm -hmm. I can give you plenty of examples of oh, that. Yeah. Like, uh, that's probably not necessary. <laughs> right. No, that's great. That's a great question. Uh, I think that anybody who cares about uh, pluralistic society has to wrestle with the version of that question, right? In whatever the whatever the case may be. And and so part of the thing is is this question of authentic, right? So when we, when I, I posited that the spirit of the thing is visible mostly from the interactions, right? The fruits of it, as it were, right? And so now, and what I did not do was set forth conditions for judgment, right? I didn't, I said, I, I said uh, that's a different lecture, right? 
but one view of the conditions for judgment have to do with these capacities, which all I have to say is Nussbaum, right? Um, but the notion is a capacities approach to human development doesn't reduce it to essential things, that we need X amount of something, or that we need to follow a particular rule in a particular way, but that, and this is not always the best either, but it, fo it fosters an incremental kind of approach and a sort of an effort at self-correction. And so people join things. Uh, many of you will remember the Jones Kool-Aid cult from which you younger people have heard the word, don't drink, the, did they drink the Kool-Aid? Well, that literally talks about 800 people killing themselves. Okay, that has a literal historical reference. Okay, and the, 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 there are instances in which there is an absence of self-correction, right? But there are other situations where there, there is self-correction. Yes, much pain is involved in suffering. It makes for great journalism that we read in the Sunday Times magazine, right? Or wherever, right? The New Yorker or whatever. But, uh, but there are other times that we don't read that's in the mundanity of full lives where people are saying to each other in a public meeting, hey, just a second, let's stop and think, think, think about this a little bit more. You know? So I think that the part of the answer is, is in that self-governance question that's in the syllabus. I did not read it carefully, so you guys are going to have to forgive me. I'm just kind of, you know, I, I wanted to provide references, right? So, um, People who aim to participate, who govern themselves and aim to participate in society and to foster activities in society that they kind of control and move, they're in, when we observe them and when we ask them, we will probably, they will probably not tell us this is the real spirit, this is the authentic spirit of the Wisconsin idea, but they'll probably say, wow, it was worth it. What we did, X, Y, that was, you know, I really felt the community spirit is probably what we'll hear. You know, do you, does this make sense? I'm sorry for, but I mean, this make a, maybe an interesting paper. I don't know. Do you want to write one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, and then you, sir. Um, so, following up on chance, I, I too uh, like that you the problem is, at some point, you cross this line where meanness or a consciousness of kind becomes problematic. And uh, so, if I just say, what was God saying to you? I'm interested in. This was back to his question. I mean, because implied in his question was also, go ahead and finish. Right. The, I don't want so to jump like, the gun. What is the idea of Wisconsin? Is there a, a, an imagined Wisconsin anymore? Right. And one of the problems that has led to this, of course, is that um, the media in marketing practice and is toward ever greater individualized data. If, instead of just sending data, individuals go, we, we, you know, just whether it's in political realms or in packaged goods, the idea that I create a preference function for 320 million Americans rather than brands that, like a Coca-Cola, that the degree of shared meaning of that Coca-Cola, um, you know, Daniel Morrison, the Library of Congressman Sosalvis, said that it, it's, the, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's the small gossamer threads of packaged goods that sometimes bring us together. It's, it's, it's the, the tiny little commercial things that we think are so trivial. What is it today that would draw Wisconsin together? So, so this is a really good question because it harkens to your question, right? 
it's it's kind of the the, the there is a question. Uh, so when we say the words imagine communities, a lot of people think of a book by Benedict Anderson of the same name. Okay, and the notion is uh, it, it kind of points to it's a harbinger for a kind of what people characterize today as a sort of a tribalism, right? Sort of a, of a reduction of our relationships to smaller and smaller uh, that, that are fostered by that, those ways of communicating, right? So, so, so to answer your question, let me first ask a quick question. How many people have read the book by Dan Kaufman, The Fall of Wisconsin? Has anybody read that book yet? Gwen's read it, you've read it. Okay, a few people have read it. Okay. So the few of you that have read it will recognize what I'm saying. And I'll, I won't say very much, but he's going to be here for the Wisconsin book. It's, it's, it's an interesting book. It, it, the, it got panned in the New York Times Book Review, and understandably so. But it speaks to this point. If what we think of as the spirit of Wisconsin being something that... Um, that uh, was recognizable not just through uh, deeds but through ideas, right? Then that spirit has definitely eroded over the decades. It's definitely eroded. And Kaufman describes that erosion. But he also describes its, its rejuvenation. But, it, but he describes it in very much fits and starts. In people, um, Around the state, he follows. He traces a half a dozen biographies in different parts of the state of people who, who um, are 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 uh, public spirited, if not Wisconsin spirited. Whatever that means, they are public spirited. And um, so, while it's true that like many people, I'm at. You know, 358.org, you know, a month before the elections, you know, are, are doing, you know, looking at the gross data. I also subscribe to a number of periodicals in, from both rural parts of the country, uh, the Storm Lake Times in Iowa, the Big Bend Sentinel, because that's where my family has a ranch still, uh, you know, uh, other periodicals. And I read them because I ask myself this question Is, by and large, where is public? Where is the spirit of public spiritedness? You know, in its various manifestations, where are people, you know, is the decline as steep as what I learned that it was in graduate school from the books that we read then? Or is the slope not so bad? Or is it leveling off? And it's hard for me to say, but I think that anybody who thinks of themselves who's willing to look in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm a citizen of the United States, and I can trace that backward, and I can imagine it going forward, they're going to ask this question of themselves, and they're going to be concerned about the answer. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't have a, a concrete answer, but except as a kind of analytic point, right, as a way of thinking about the problem. Whenever I hear people say, I'm moving to Canada, I think, well, if that's your option, you know, right or left. When, when I see, I was in D.C. last week, and the guy said, I'm, you know, he had a T-shirt like this, gun, I love my guns, and I'm thankful for Obama, because my guns are like Obama, unregistered and undocumented. Like Obama's voters, undocumented. And, and, I, and I went to him, and I said, man, I like my guns, too. But I voted for Obama, you know? I mean, I grew up hunting and fishing and stuff, you know? And I don't know. You know what I mean? So, so uh, it's uh, allowing others, allowing the complexity of others into our lives, there's a real challenge. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm starting to. That particular point, though, for me, made, at first I applauded when you said uh, the reverse Wisconsin idea, the concept of that, folks coming to the campus. And then I stopped and I thought, no, wait a second. If, if we're talking about true relationships, true dialogue, right. 
then that is an essential aspect of the Wisconsin idea. That's not a new thing that's happening because if you don't have those understandings built into anything that you're doing from your uh, whatever the, the matrix is, whatever the, the your your area of expertise that you may be interacting with across communities, if you don't know the community, and if you aren't in community, quite literally, then you aren't truly fulfilling the spirit. I agree with you. I agree with you. But that's why we have a republic, yeah. right? So my response is twofold here, right? One, that's why we have uh, the principle, the political science principle of subsidiarism, right? Nested governance. But that's also why uh, shared frames of reference are so important. And, but, but not simply shared in the sake of the past, but what needs to be shared in order to move forward. Across, our, across differences, who in here isn't challenged by somebody's identity? Everybody in here has got to be challenged. Everybody's got to be challenged by somebody's identity. You're not quite human if you can't admit that. And, but we're all going to wake up tomorrow morning and we might have to confront that which challenges us. And so if we're not looking forward to try and develop those shared frame of references, and I'm not talking about new ideas here, I'm talking about simply being able to get along, simply being able to recognize humanity in each other. Right? Then, you know, we're kind of in trouble. Now, so that being one side, but the other side of your question is equally important. If we are, you know, in a republic for which uh, subsidiarism matters, then our engagement with our elected folks matters as well. And there, I think, to Tom's point, is a concern that I'm not sure I've seen uh, reflected in my anecdotal readings of things. I don't see that engagement uh, that I once saw, that my, my dad, you know, still writes letters, literally, <laughs> to his elected representatives, you know. Um, I don't see that in my generation to that extent, and certainly I... Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that it's not been in greater decline. And so in that absence of uh, there, that, that, that may be smaller opportunity to engage in the self-governance and to be a participant, generally speaking, you know, in political activities at whatever scale. And I think that's, you know, a point you make well. You know, the... the uh, they're only going to know us if we go know them, <laughs> right? So we gotta, we gotta go know them. Yes, go in and then you. There you go. You know, in order to get across the scale of society that we have, right, we've got to think about, you know, those concrete relational opportunities that, that help create common frames and make that, make our scale more tractable, make the size of our country. It hasn't changed geographically, it's just, you know, so much more. More tractable. It's not going to solve all the problems, but more tractable. Yes, ma'am. Does anybody remember bookmobiles? Who? Bookmobiles. Oh, you bet. Okay, well, what we need is a Wisconsin idea bookmobile. Okay. Travel around the state, share, whatever. You know, we can make it like the Oscar Wiener thing or something, make it really cool and awesome for people who travel to it, right? I think it's a great idea. <laughs> there are many forms. That is a great idea. And uh, if somebody's, you know, 
a bookmobile for the Wisconsin idea. Wherever, I don't know who else bugging the room, but anyway. We, we could even buy some of those wiener mobiles now and use those. Right. Now, so, so there's, there's going to be different ways. Even, there's always been seg segments of society. There's always been a variety of ways that you could lump, as it were, uh, groups of people into uh, similar characteristics. So there's got to be, one has to be able to appeal to those different things. The message has got to remain the same, even if its delivery is slightly, is different, you know, it's different. Thank you all for your attention. I hope you all have a good evening. <laughs>